So, uh, thank you all for coming out on this kind of a cold February night here. Um, I appreciate it. I've given a lot of these types of speeches. It's funny, you know, I wrote the book about a good eight years ago now. And I had always intended for it to be published. Um, I just never knew that I would have uh, so many opportunities to speak about it. And it's been uh, very much a secular blessing. It's been a wonderful thing. It's put me in touch with so many people I never knew I would meet. Um, I've, I've addressed crowds of hundreds of teachers at different conferences. I've addressed crowds of high school students, uh, probably the most interesting and the most fulfilling for me is I've gotten to speak to a lot of groups of young uh, incarcerated juvenile uh, so-called offenders. Um, and that's been very wonderful for me because that's an area that I always thought I would be involved in in my life. Um, I am going to just talk a little bit about the history of this book, how I came to write it, um, and then I'll open up for Q&A because for me the Q&A is really the part that I think people are more interested in, in hearing me kind of go on about the book and stuff. Um, again, I've, I've spoken to a lot of audiences, and I always find that um, there's something very wonderful that goes on when you have a little give and take between audience and author. I've been in the seats a lot for authors, and I've been up here, and I always appreciate the Q&A a lot more. Um, so I will just start out. I was... Born in Brooklyn, I guess, I'm assuming everyone in here read the book already, or maybe you read the book, maybe you like me in school and you didn't really read the entire book. Um, but I'll just give a little brief overview here. I was born in Brooklyn in 1968 um, and moved, my family moved to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which back then was a very different area than it is now. When I went back, I wanted to write this book, and I had the idea to write this book around 2004, 2005. And I went back with a writer friend of mine to my old neighborhood, the Lower East Side. When I was growing up in the Lower East Side, it was such a kind of hideous place that was uh, full of crack dens. It was a dangerous place. I lived in what they call, the Hollywood likes to call it Alphabet City. Uh, we never called it Alphabet City, but basically I lived on Avenue D. And the way New York was set up, is, you know, do you know of it? Okay. So the way New York was set up, you know, you have street numbers, avenues, and then once you got to Avenue A, there was Avenue A, B, C, and D. And it was a very popular notion that if you were going past Avenue A at night, you probably had some very uh, dark reasons for going past Avenue A. Um, Avenue A was kind of where the East Village stopped, where the hip people lived, and where you went for you know, a lot of ugliness went on past, especially at night. Um, but I grew up in that, and for me, it was extremely normal. All of my friends um, growing up were black and Puerto Rican. Um, and then when I started going to a school in the, East, in the Greenwich Village, I met a whole variety of different races and got to really uh, soak up the, the melting pot that New York is. But growing up, my neighborhood was pretty much black and Puerto Rican and Dominican as well. Um, and as I mentioned, it's a very dangerous neighborhood. But when I went back to write this book, uh, I wanted to see the neighborhood, and I actually wanted to do something that I haven't done, I hadn't done since my shooting, which I wanted to go back to the block where the shooting occurred. Uh, I had never gone just because simply I was really not that interested in seeing it. But once I wanted to write this book, I thought I have to start with going back to that block. And so I went back, and it's kind of funny, like gentrification has really taken over, and you know, I mean, we see it here going on in Portland as well and many areas. But my block where I was shot is now a super hip place that has like three different beer bars and three different uh, hip clothing stores. NYU has taken over and it's basically like little NYU now. And you would never, ever dream that it was once a neighborhood that was full of danger and intrigue and, and darkness as it, as it was when I grew up. Um, but I was glad to go back because I really wanted to just see what it was like and I wanted to feel what it was like to wheel in the spot where I last stood up. Um, and it was, it was powerful. It was powerful for me. I took a few pictures and it really did help me get on the path to write this book. Um, so I started out writing this book 
and I really was writing it as kind of a biography. Like I didn't have any real sense of direction. I only knew that I had read other people's stories of their lives and found some of them touching and some of them not so touching. Um, but for the most part, I had enjoyed reading memoirs. Um, and I really took something from about 90% of memoirs, whether I uh, grew up, whether I knew what the writer was really saying or whether I related to the writer that much, I almost always took something from it. Um, so I started writing this book and I was really rambling. Like I started out when I was a little kid and I was rambling on about how what life was like when I grew up. And around page 500 was when I finally got into like my high school years. And I showed it to an editor friend of mine. And she gave me the best advice that I've ever gotten, which was she said, whoa, 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 show me, stop, stop, stop. You know, you're a great guy, but you're not Mount Martin Luther King. You're not Malcolm X. You don't deserve this much story time. Like you have to whittle this down or else the reader is going to drop it after page 200. And she told me, you have to find some kind of way to tell this story, narrow it down, find it at a specific time in your life, go with that, um, and really have a unique, try to, find, try to come up with a unique way of telling this story. Because um, we've all seen the kind of sad story of the, you know, the kid who grew up in a bad neighborhood who had bad things happen. And she said, so two pieces of advice. Tell it in a unique way and really narrow it down to a specific time. And at first I was kind of put off. I thought, hey, you know, this is my story. You know, uh, I want to tell it the way I want to tell it. But she's, you know, she's incredibly smart. Um, I always had a lot of respect for her. And I thought, you know, if she's saying this, let me go back. So I threw out all 500 pages. And I just started to think about a way to tell the story. And I remembered um, one of the memoirs that had touched me deeply was a novel by uh, Isabel Allende, who's you know most famous for House of the Spirits. Um, but I've always loved her writing, and she wrote a very touching memoir called Paula. I don't know if anyone has read it. If you read it, it's a you can attest in it. it's a very touching story about how she basically sat by her uh, dying daughter's bedside um, while her daughter was suffering from a degenerative disease, um, and it's really like a love letter to her daughter. The entire memoir. And she wrote it like a letter. And I remember thinking that that was a very effective way to tell a story. And I thought, and it really got me thinking. And I thought, hmm, what if I address this book to the person who shot me, who I know I will never meet in my lifetime? But what if I try to just let that person know a little bit about the effect that they had on my life? Um, what kind of took place after they shot me? Um, and it ultimately let them know that uh, I didn't hate them, that I had the power within me to forgive them. And although I have no notion that the person would ever read it, the actual person who did it would ever read it, I just thought, you know, address it to that person and let them know at the end of the day that you have no anger toward them, that your life actually turned out well, but that it had a very serious effect on you. Um, so I started to write it. And I, funny, I... I'm a person who believes in, in coming up, that the first idea you come up with, you should stick with. And for some reason, the name Marcus jumped out at me. So I just named him Marcus. I said, he's Marcus. And I started to visualize him. I knew that growing up in that neighborhood, he had to be black or Hispanic. And so in my, in my mind, I came up with a kind of a, a guy who was probably led a more difficult life than myself, maybe had a drug-addicted parent or so, um, but who grew up in a very difficult household. Um, and I started to write to this person and I have to say, you know, I was, when I was writing the 500 page version, which was going to be a thousand pages eventually, it was, it didn't come so easily. But once I got this idea to write to this Marcus character, it just flowed. Um, and really it took me about a good three months to write the entire thing. Um, and I did it here. I started out in Eugene where I was finishing up grad school. And then I actually moved here to Portland to try to get a teaching job. And while I couldn't get a teaching job here in Portland because there was a freeze on hiring teachers at the time, I just wrote it. And I went to the same coffee shop every day and wrote. Um, and it was a beautiful thing. And after three months, I had something to show around. And so I showed that very same editor. And she said she loved it, but it really wasn't her style. You know, she was more into doing kind of hard-hitting war uh, memoir uh, memoirs. 
And so she said, you know, I'm not going to take it on myself, but show it out there. And I sent it to about 50 publishers and got turned down by every one of them, um, which I just learned is part of the business. You have to kind of get used to it if you're going to be a writer. If any, any writers in here, you better get used to rejection because it happens all the time. Um, and then I said, I read an article in the New York Times about a company and different writers that were having success self-publishing. And I read the article and saw that a couple of the writers had had really great success, one and even turned her series into a screenplay. Um, and I thought, okay, you know what, let me try this. It's probably going to cost me a good $1,500, $2,000 when I did all the research. But I thought, you know, it'll be like when uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker and when Spike Lee started out how he had to invest in his own films and put it on a credit card and hope that he got somewhere. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. And so I self-published it through a company in Indiana. And the whole notion was that they paid you according to how many copies you sold. And they took about 90% of the royalties. So I knew I wasn't going to make any money off of this. But the hope was <laughs> that uh, I would get it into a, the hands of someone famous like an Oprah. That was really my big dream. I said, if Oprah gets a hold of this, she's going to fall in love with me. And I'm going to be set for life. And Will Smith is going to do the movie role. And I'll be great. <laughs> Um, and so we really, me and my friends, we started this whole campaign. We wrote to Oprah every day, um, and I had a Facebook page, and we sent her my Facebook page, and I would literally sit there and write to Oprah on a daily basis via email um, and send copies of the book to her studios back when she had her this daily show in Chicago. Um, and after a year of that, I realized that uh, Oprah was not going to write me back, that Oprah was uh, too big for Jerry McKill. So I just said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do my own little publishing and hope that this goes well. And I uh, used my Facebook page and sent it out and um, had a little success. I think at that time, within a two-year time period, I sold maybe 250 copies. And I thought, okay, you know what? You have to be happy with this and just move on with your life. I didn't write it to be famous. I didn't write it. A lot of people assume that I wrote it because I had to get something out of me. People said, people always tell me, it must have been really cathartic. You must have, it must have been like good therapy for you. And the reality was, you know, it was like 30 years after my shooting. I had no real issues to work out. I was way over it, and I just wanted to write the story because I really thought that maybe uh, my type of story could touch someone else who had been through a trauma in their life or someone else who had um, maybe felt that uh, they were the odds were against them to be successful. Or, um, I just really thought that there were elements of my story that could touch a lot of people. Uh, so after two years, I just stopped promoting it and moved on with my life. Uh, but I decided that every now and then I was going to send it to a writer who I really respected. And so I sent it to uh, Juno Diaz. I sent it to um, a couple of other writers. And one writer who I was really into at the time was a writer named uh, Lori Moore. And she had a book called The Gate at the Stairs that I just fell in love with. And uh, at the time, she was teaching at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I sent her the book, and I would always send this kind of simple letter when I sent it to authors. I would say, hey, you know, I'm a big fan of your work, and I don't expect anything of this. I just want you to have a copy of my book, and I want to know that it's sitting on your nightstand somewhere or maybe on your bookshelf. And that was it. I had no expectations. But uh, I got extremely lucky, and I, to this day, uh, it bothers friends of mine to hear me say this, but I really think the main reason why my book was published by Random House, was just through a series of lucky events. And what happened was that Lori Moore received my book, and at the same time she received my book, she had an assignment to write for the New York Times review of books. And her assignment was to write on memoir. And she uh, was touched by my book and thought, hey, I'm going to include Jerry McGill's book. And it's actually a really great thing because the New York Times has a policy that they do not review uh, self-published books. And Lori Moore basically said to them, I'm going to review this book, and either you're going to accept my assignment or you're not. And because she's a big wig, they, they kind of said, okay, we'll take it, even though he's a self-published author. Um, and so she didn't even tell me or anything. It was actually very funny. I received an email a week before the article came out, the review came out, uh, basically from someone in her camp saying to me, hey, just so you know, this is coming out next week. Um, and it was shocking to me because I hadn't heard from her for six months. 
and I assume that she didn't get it or she didn't read it or what have you. But I got an email from someone saying, hey, just so you know, next week's New York Review of Books, Lori Moore is reviewing your book. And I like I remember kind of I was, I was a teacher at the time in Eugene. I remember I read that at lunchtime, and like it was one of those moments when my jaw just kind of sank and my heart kind of fell into my stomach, and I thought, wow, this is big. And sure enough, right after Lori Moore's review came out, um, I started getting flooded with emails from different publishers and agents who were interested in in telling my story and republishing my story, which is very funny because some of them were the same people who rejected me about two years ago. Um, and all it took was the uh, the kind of uh, blessing of a Lori Moore to get them reinterested. And so basically, long story short, a bunch of uh, publishers reached out to me. I went with Random House because I knew them best. And also I had a good friend who was a writer who uh, spoke highly of the, the company the, at Random House that was uh, publishing it that was interested in publishing it. Um, and long story short, they picked it up. They re had, they had to rebuy my contract from the cell publisher, which I think cost them $2,000. Um, and then they put out my book and I've had so many uh, successes since then, so many wonderful opportunities. Um, every now and then I get a call from them saying, hey Jerry, this school in Kentucky would like you to come speak because their freshman high schoolers are reading it. Um, and I head out to Kentucky and have a great conversation. Um, and I've had a lot of these opportunities. The, the opportunity to work with young incarcerated men came from this as well. Um, so it's been a very great experience for me. I didn't expect it to last this long. I really thought, you know, I wrote it, um, like I said, close to 10 years ago. Um, and then the next published version came out five years ago. And I didn't expect it to have this kind of shelf life, but it's been, it's been great. Um, but I'm actually, I've been working on so many other projects now that I've kind of, um, I haven't picked up the book literally in five years. Um, I have a difficult time like reading or rereading what I've written in the past. Um, so I haven't picked it up in that, but I, I know, <laughs> I still remember all the finer points of it. Um, but I've been working on so many other projects. I've been working on a musical. I have a musical background. When I was in New York, I worked with children's music, on children's musicals a lot and I've been working on a musical about the life of a uh, Trayvon Martin. I've worked on a couple of novels. I've worked on a screenplay. Um, I've been working on a play for about two years now about the life of Bessie Coleman, the first uh, woman to get her pilot, first African American to get their pilot's license in America. Uh, well, she didn't get it in America. She had to go to France to get it. But the first uh, African American to fly with a pilot's license in America. Um, I've got so many different interests. I would like to shoot a film someday. Um, so really it's funny like that I've, I've really put this book behind me and have moved on to so many other areas um, and just hope that uh, I can kind of follow up this book with something something else. It's been difficult. You know, I've sent out, again, I'm going through the whole thing all over again of sending out uh, ideas to publishers and stuff and getting rejection letters. Um, but I'm just going to stick with it because I really don't know what else to do. Um, I enjoy it, and I enjoy the process. As anybody here is a writer, probably I think maybe many people here are writers. It's extremely frustrating. There's a lot of self-doubt. Um, there are times when I think, why did I write this? Like I go back and look at something and think, this is shit what I just wrote. Um, but, you know, it, that's the constant voice in in, in uh, artist's mind telling them what they did wasn't good enough or, or there's always this constant battle um, with believing that your work actually deserves to be out there. And I'm in it for the long haul, and um, I just, uh, again, appreciate everyone here who took the time to read this book, and hopefully people got something out of it. I don't expect everyone to get something out of it. I've talked to uh, high schoolers and had a high schooler tell me he was actually kind of bored throughout most of it, but his teacher forced him to read it, which was uh, okay. You know, I, I've been a teacher. I know that feeling of forcing kids to read uh, work or forcing students to read work. Um, but hopefully, you know, sometimes I know that sometimes you read something and then 10 years later you think, hey, that actually meant something. So um, I thank you for reading it and um, I believe now I will open it up for Q&A. Is that a good idea? Um, and again, I, I always like to preface this by saying uh, I am a very open person. There's nothing I'm afraid of discussing. There's no topic that I am uncomfortable discussing. So... 
Um, any questions you have, I'll be happy to to address. I just probably pass the mic around or something uh, so she can record it for recording purposes. Second mic. Hello? Okay, who wants it? There you go. I was just curious, um, hearing about all your other projects that you're working on, a lot of them seem also to center on an individual. Um, and I was just wondering, like, after you wrote one with the obvious first choice of person to write about yourself, like then did you move on to other people or how do you choose kind of like on whom or what topic to like focus your next project? Yeah, um, so I'm actually, I've been working on a couple of the novels um, that are pure fiction, but every now and then uh, a topic does reach out to me and really grab me by the heart. Um, and I've always wanted to tell the stories of people of color. Like I really am invested in um, having the stories of people of color out there in the world. And the Trayvon Martin, when it happened, when when the he was murdered, I will it it was it was a very strong moment for me. Um, and when the court decision came out, I remember very clearly. I was at the gym uh, in the Pearl. I was at Twenty Four Hour Fitness working out when it came on TV. And I almost had like a little breakdown at the gym because I almost couldn't believe that that happened. It was a very uh, stirring moment for me, the whole Trayvon Martin scene um, and what happened there. And I always knew that someday I would want to try to tell something about that. And then his mother just recently wrote a memoir um, all about him and the court case and how it affected them. And I was very touched by her memoir and that kind of stirred me to start this project. But um, yeah, to answer your question, I've just there are a couple of stories that I've always felt you know were were really worth telling, um, and I believe that's one of them. And uh, stories about also you know Bessie Coleman is a story about someone who I believe, similar to myself, had all the odds against him, um, and went on and said you know even though life has dealt me these cards, I'm actually going to do my best to. Uh, go above what, what life dealt me. And those stories I just find, I hate to use the term inspiring, but those stories I do find uplifting and kind of just should be told. I think we need more stories like that. So um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen every now and then. And that's, that's why I chose those two stories in particular. Okay, so were you a writer or were you writing before you wrote this first book? Ah, Yes, it's a point. I've been a writer since I was like about six years old. I remember in first grade, uh, I wrote a little tiny short story kind of inspired by some story that we were reading in class. Um, it may have been Dr. Seuss for all I know. But I always, I remember being a kid, always loving creating my own world. And some people will say, well, it's probably because the neighborhood you came from, the world you came from was so bad that you had to create your own world. But I really just believe I enjoyed creating characters I enjoyed coming up with plots, um, and also I liked making people laugh, and I found that a lot of times I was writing stories that were humorous, and uh, I had a great teacher in the second grade who started to read my stories aloud, um, and I'd always get a good laugh response from the, the uh, my fellow students, and I always just loved it, and I thought, hey, this is fun. If I one can make a living like this, I would like to do it, um, and I really do believe that um, had life gone on in a different path, I probably would have tried to go to a writing program like in undergrad and what have you. Um, I wound up just doing what people told me someone in a wheelchair should do, which was try to do computer programming. Because I was told at a young age that, you know, someone with disability, you're probably not going to have a lot of opportunities, but computers will always be there for you, and that's the way of the future. So that's what I did in undergrad, much to my chagrin. Um, but I, uh, I've always loved writing, and I've always been a writer, and I've always known that eventually I would write and I've written in lots of forms. I've written journalism pieces, you know, I've written nonfiction, I've written essays and um I've always known that writing was what I would do in addition. I would also love filmmaking, but I always knew that writing would always be the center of what I did. And just a follow up, can you speak on how it was to start writing about yourself or 
if there were struggles associated with that or if there weren't and that was kind of where you were most comfortable? Yeah, um, you know, writing about myself, I always thought, um, it's a funny thing to bring up because I really always thought that it was, it took a certain amount of arrogance to write about yourself. And for a while I would, I was really hesitant because I thought that my story was such a tiny story. Um, you know, a kid gets shot in a neighborhood, goes on to lead a good life. I really, that, that was really the, the heart of my story. Like, you know, I, I haven't had anything horrible. I never had a drug addiction after this. I never um, was abused. Um, I basically, I was shot, had very loving people around me and went on to do good things with my life. And I really fought with this notion that, hey, your story is not interesting enough, like, to tell, like, uh, you know, there are people with greater stories than you or people with more fascinating stories than you and why are you trying to tell this story um but i had so many people who would say to me on occasion you know i think that you uh your your story is worth telling i think that you've that i would tell them about a, an episode in my life and they would think hey you should write that down um and i just went with that i went with that and i knew also at the core of my story was something that people could relate to which was uh, a struggle a notion that um, something happened to you that could have held you down if you let it hold you down. Um, but I was, I made the choice not to. And I believe that's a story that a lot of people struggle with. Um, even, you know, you don't have to have a disability to struggle with that kind of story. Um, it could be something more, it could be something less. It could, it could be anything almost. But I think a lot of people, I, I knew that at the, at the core of my story was something that a certain population could relate to. Not everybody but a certain wide population could relate to. Does the meaning of the story shift when it's relating to, say, another Marcus or someone who causes the, like, takes all the cards away? Like, who has that ability to do that? Hmm. Does the meaning of the story shift? Like, It is meant to touch people who've been through struggle yes yes does that ever change at all when it's towards people who who the people who read it is it like who caused the struggle yeah <laughs> it's an interesting question and it it brings me back um to the first time i did this reading that a bunch of incarcerated youth in san francisco who for the most part were all gang related um their teacher assigned them my book and uh, made them read it. And then I came out and spoke to them. And there were about 100 students in all and four different classes of students read it. And it was fascinating for me because it was the first time I was ever uh, working with an audience who very much were probably closer to Marcus than anyone else um, that I had ever addressed. A lot of them... Um, and I never got this verified, but I'm pretty sure from just having small conversations with them um, that a lot of them were in prison for either having taken someone's life or having um, violently acted against another person in such a way that um, they were incarcerated for it. And it was a, it was uh, fascinating to just talk with that audience. Um, and the thing that I came away with most was that a lot of them, you know, and dear Marcus, I talk about how I forgive Marcus at the end and I really have no anger towards him. And these, uh, this audience didn't believe me. And I remember we would have these, we, and during Q&A, they would say things to me like, come on, man, be serious though. You don't really forgive that guy. I mean, look at him. They would tell, and several of them told me, he fucked up your life, man. Like, you don't really forgive that guy, do you? And I realized at the time that, wow, um, it didn't occur to me. I mean, I knew of that lifestyle, but I knew that I'd forgotten that really a lot of them came from a lifestyle where it was if someone took from you, you take from them twice as hard or something. And the idea of forgiving someone who hurt you was just really out there. Um, and so I imagine for them, um, for that audience, it changed quite a bit. Like it wasn't, it wasn't what I intended. Um, and it's funny because some of them did come up to me on the side afterwards and say, hey, you know what my brothers were saying? I don't believe that for one second. I think it's very powerful that you forgave this guy. And I want someone to forgive me when I get out of here.
But I know that for that audience, it definitely changed. It was the first time I was faced with that, this notion that, hey, maybe my story, the, uh, the, the soul of my story is not coming across the way I intended it to. Um, so I imagine it does. Like, like almost any art form, it changes for the audience that, it's in, that, it, that is seeing it. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Like, so what like what was that process like for you like the whole healing process and being able to forgive like when did you go through that or decide that you were going to forgive him it's it's um funny because i people are surprised to, to hear me say it but i never really went through an anger period you know i went through periods where um i thought man it's kind of a drag that i'm never going to be able to roller skate again or it's kind of a drag that I'm never going to be able to ride a bike again. Or it's kind of a drag that I'm not going to be able to hike up you know, that mountain in Central Park or that hill in Central Park that I used to hike up. But I never really went through an anger period. And I believe, and this is um, kind of rare, but I believe it was because I was so surrounded by loving people. Um, you know, my doctors, my therapists, uh, my mother, um, that I was never really allowed to wallow in in kind of pity or anger i always knew or i was always reminded that if i worked hard enough on it, my rehab i would go on to lead a fulfilling life um so there's really not a period in my life when i was ever filled with anger and lashing out of course there were moments when uh i really was kind of regretful that that this happened to me but i never went through like this prolonged period of anger I was always pretty positive, pretty focused on the future, um, and um, there was never a, like a, a long process of, hey, now I'm in this stage, now I'm in this stage. I was pretty much always looking forward and moving forward. Um, and a lot, like I said, a lot of people assume that like writing this book helped me get through a lot of anger and stuff, but that's really not the case. I never had that anger. Writing this book was just good for me because it was in a, in many ways it was actually wonderful to go back and revisit some of these moments that I did during the writing of this book. Like it was wonderful to go back and remember the the love that the nurses showed me. It was wonderful to go back and remember the love that my doctor showed me. It was wonderful to to go back and remember some of the dark times, like you know di different experiences with my mother and my sister, friends who. Uh, left behind who I had to leave behind and um so to answer your question it was never really like an anger period it was never anything that I had to go through like any process um it just kind of came to me to write this and there was never a period when I thought okay now I forgive you um I think for a long time I, I had forgiven this person and just never really articulated it until I started writing this book Do you believe in fate? <laughs> Do I believe in fate? Um, huh, it's such a double-edged question. Right. I, I guess I believe in fate. I believe... It's a bad answer, but Maybe. I believe in things happening for a reason. Um, I don't fully believe it, though, but I do believe that there are times um, when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time but it actually proves later on to be the right place at the right time. And I um, talk about that a little, a little bit in the book, but I do believe that actually in some bizarre way, my life has shown me that actually being in a wheelchair um, was actually, I don't want to say a good thing, but many wonderful things came about because of it for both me and other people in my life. Yeah, I guess like I was thinking of it in terms of like experiencing love and like your mother's love or even like the nurse's love. Like, would you have ever experienced that kind of love if it wasn't for fate bringing you to a circumstance? Yeah, you know, it's one of, and it's one of those questions that I get asked from time to time, and it's like it's impossible for me to know. Totally. Um, I know that I would have experienced my mother's love, um, <laughs> actually, but I don't actually know like how deeply I would have experienced it. Like, you know, I I can say that. Uh, for a strong part of our my childhood, then my mother and I had a, a shallow relationship. We loved each other, but it wasn't 
We went, we, I never grew up in one of those houses where, like, you know, I, I have friends now who every single time they leave the house, they have to tell their mother they love them or their father they love them. They're on phone conversations and they end every phone conversation with love you. Um, that was not my house at all. Um, we didn't say what we, we felt it, but we didn't say stuff like that. And we didn't articulate uh, love for each other. So I don't know. It's impossible for me to know. Um, but I do know that I had loving friendships and a loving relationship with my mother. Along that same line, do you think uh, it might be good for you to, not good, I'm sorry. I, it just came to my, my mind when she asked you about fate and your answer to think of the fate of Marcus. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, the, what's the Christmas carol where the, he's taken back into uh, – <laughs> to see Christmas past and give, give, give him not, and again, I almost became vindictive mm -hmm. to give him an opportunity to uh, maybe explore his fate and let him see what, uh, anyway, I, I think you, I've expressed it to some extent to what I was thinking. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's, I mean, it's funny also. I mean, I've often thought about like what a Marcus would be like and how a Marcus's life may have turned out. Uh, of course, at the end of the day, it's kind of a fruitless thing to wonder because it's like I'll never know. Um, I will truly never know, and it 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 doesn't. I don't think it's a healthy way for me to spend my energy, spending a lot of time wondering whatever happened to that guy who shot me in the back. Um, but it's it's fascinating to wonder. Wonder can drive you mad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It can it can drive you crazy. Uh, are so. Are you accepting of what happened? And like, do you ever wish that things didn't happen, whether it was good or bad? Or are you grateful that everything happened and you didn't want one thing to be different? Um, I'm definitely accepting of what happened. Uh, you know, there were uh, times there when I really thought that my life was going to go a different way. That guy was very good in sports as a child. Um, I was also very involved in the arts. Um, and I was taking, you know, ballet classes, which was extremely rare for someone from where I came from. But I got very fortunate uh, to have a, a contemporary ballet school, a renowned ballet school, come to my school to audition minority youth. And they chose me as one of their students. I was very interested in the performing arts. Um, and I actually believe that had my life turned out differently, I probably would have been someone like, a Gregory Hines or someone like a, a Savion Glover, someone who was a performer who had multi levels of performance ability. Um, so in a way, I spent a lot of time wondering, hey, uh, I kind of wish I had been able to go down that path. But at the same time, um, my life turned out, things turned out so well for me. I've had so many rich experiences that I really can't dwell on what could have been like we we're saying it'll drive you crazy if you do all that thinking about what could have been and so i feel very grateful that you know i went on to live this kind of life and i'm actually grateful that i'm alive you know i mean the reality is that had the bullet entered uh maybe two two or or three inches to the right that it would have shattered my spine and i would have been uh, the type of person who had no movement from the neck down and had to like use a device to even move my wheelchair that was attached to my mouth. Um, had it been a couple of feet up, it may have uh, you know damaged my brain to the extent that I would perhaps not even be alive. So I, I am just grateful that I could live the kind of life that I live and that I live independently. Um, so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I am grateful for yeah, what, what uh, happened. Yeah, I meant more like, um grateful for not necessarily it happening but everything that happened created a chain effect and created events that you learned lessons from and made you who you are today you know you were saying that you wished oh you could see yourself down this path do you think you would have got there without those morals and everything that you learned from what had happened yeah and, so, and that's a question i get off into and it's what i can't say for sure what I can say is that I had a kind of a test pattern in seeing the, my friends around me. I had lots of good friends in the neighborhood, lots of good friends in the school. And if any indication, if, if the way their lives went is any indication, it probably would have been a bit of a darker path. 
Um, a lot of my friends went on to become involved in drugs. Um, a lot of my friends went on to become involved in activities that would eventually wind them up in jail. Um, and so I can assume that maybe that would have been something that would have happened to me. Um, I can't know for certain. And, and so in a way, one could say this, people have often asked me, you know, do you think this saved you from a different life of, of a crime and um, what have you? And I can't say. Um, I can only say that um, I knew that even as a child, like I had a certain um, soul that wasn't really geared towards crime. I was afraid of like um, drugs. When a lot of my friends were experiencing drugs before my shooting, and I would never... Uh, participate just because I was always afraid of what my mother would think of it if I did. So I I don't believe I was heading down the exact same path, but a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the kids I grew up with went on to have very severe struggles with drug use and in and out of systems. Hi. Um, I just want to say that I really admire you and you're a very... Um impressive person, um, not impressive in like the weird stigmatized way, but it's just really great to hear you speak. Um, I wanted to know if you ever envisioned yourself as an activist or um, as someone fighting for other people's rights or um, being in that role now um, it is just kind of a consequence of the circumstances that have led to that. Um, and then also, like, if you ever feel, um, like you want to, uh, like, take more action than just creating art that is meant to uplift and, like, where that line for you is drawn, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you for saying what you said earlier. Is, uh, um, I try my best to be as, uh, as good a person as I can be. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's funny to hear you use the term activist, and I know that I've been described that way in the past. Yeah. Um, I don't really ever, I don't consider myself an activist. Yeah. I don't have the energy to be an activist. Um, I'm not someone who, well, I've, I've, I've done it in the past, like uh, when I was a lot younger, um, and working with disability rights groups in other countries, and I've taken parts in marches and protests, um, but that was when I was a lot younger. And... I actually feel like now, like I don't have the energy for it anymore, and I also, I feel a certain pessimism now, and it's it it saddens me to talk about it and to articulate it, but the reality is that I don't really know that um, activism matters as much as it used to. Yeah. I don't know if I believe that uh, marching with like-minded people and throwing my fists in the air and chanting something really makes a difference. Um, you know, I've watched and I envied a lot of my friends who went to rallies after several of the shootings of people of color um, throughout the nation. I watched and envied a lot of my friends who went to rallies after Trump was nominated or elected, excuse me. Um, and I envied them, but at the same time, I have this kind of a uh, pessimism that I don't know that it really goes anywhere anymore like you know we have these marches and then a week later something happens and seems to set humanity back um, and I just I don't I don't know that I believe in activism as much as it was like back in the 60s or back when it seemed like these things really did have an effect they did they really did affect change I believe now that the world is an uglier place, and I just, I'm not really sure. Um, and sometimes I feel ashamed about it. You know, a lot of my friends went out after, um, you know, Philando Castro was, was, was shot in Minneapolis. A lot of them were marching out there, and I remember reading a lot of their Facebook posts and thinking, hey, how come I'm not out there with them? Like, you know, I'm, I'm very angry myself about this, but I'm sitting at home. Um, but I really do believe, though, and I've seen other uh, artists talk about this, that, not everybody's place is on the front line. Sometimes your place is to sit there with a pen and a paper um, and try to make your statement that way. But uh, yeah, so I, I don't really consider myself an activist. 
and I don't know that I ever will be. I, I really would love to have an effect by having someone read words and, and, and be touched that way. Yeah, definitely. I, it just feels like at this time, activism seems to be really overlapping with art. Um, and in many ways, I do consider you an activist because some of the most movement that we can make in our society now is by cracking open people's minds. And that's what your art is doing. It's telling the stories of people whose stories need to be told. And I think that makes the world a better place. In well, a thank cheesy way. I, yeah. I really hope you're right because uh, it's really the way, where I feel most comfortable now. Yeah. Yeah, this was just a comment, not really a question, but just to say that, like, I really think all the things you were saying contribute to the discourse of, like, restorative justice or transformative justice and, like, the critiques of the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration that are happening because that is really, like, a punitive model and like you know that people need to be shunned and punished versus like forgiven <laughs> like mm -hmm. the things that you were saying and like if somebody like you can forgive that that is a model for other people who need to get out of that mindset of just punishing and shaming and isolating right right and i do believe like in a, in a way i mean it's not an activism but i do try to do little things here and there like i try to affect um you know i've been working uh, I haven't been able to do it in the past month, but I do my best to get out to uh, Woodburn where they have the correctional facility. And I've been mentoring a couple of youths out there at the correctional facility um, who are interested in writing. And so I, I try to, to do little things here and there that I think uh, will maybe make a difference in someone's life. But um, and then hopefully that's its own form of activism or yeah, Jerry, I just want to thank you so much for uh, giving this talk tonight. Um, I have not read your book. Shame I, on you. I hope to. <laughs> I didn't know it existed until today when I heard you. I just heard part of your interview on OPB, which uh, prompted me to find out where you were speaking and to come tonight. And I brought my grandson here. Um, and... Uh, Anyway, I, I just uh, I'm I'm just uh, honored to be here and hear you speak, and I will get your book now. Thank you, and thank you for coming out to, to bring your grandson. <laughs> um, how do you feel that your work today is inclusive to? Uh, individuals that may or may not have gone through the same experiences you have or how do you think you could create a dialogue to like connect to more people um well I hope you know my story again is one that features a, a slightly traumatic event um, but I do believe that you know again it's not about the shooting it's about someone going through someone that really is going through something that affected their self-esteem, made them insecure, made them feel alienated or isolated. Um, and coming to terms with that and being able to um, maybe address that in their own self and um, use, use it to their advantage. Um, so I don't, I, I would hope that that's how my work could reach um, different communities. I, I tried to make it clear in the book that it's not just about you know being shot and um, and getting over such a, an event as that. That it's about it could happen to anyone. It could be anything. It could be cancer. It could be um, panic attacks. It could be someone who um, maybe has to face a family that doesn't accept choices that they've made. It could be so many different things. Uh, and that's what I hope. Uh, I don't know that that came through as strongly as it could, but uh, it's in, especially in conversations like this, where I do get to reach out to um, popu different populations, and especially uh, when I'm talking to high school students or college students, that I get to maybe address other issues and make it try to make it clear that it's not just about a traumatic event that shapes your life. It could be something small and meaningful to you. Um, so I, I hope that that comes across. I think that it's a, kind of a subtle part of the book. 
Um, but I, I, I hope that that, that that comes across that um, it's really about dealing with a, something that affects you in a very dark way and maybe hopefully not letting it overtake you. Is there any aspects of your life now that reflects that? That you'll be able to tie to that? Hmm. Aspects of my life today that affect... You know, off the top of my head, I can't think of one. I can say, though, that I'm struggling today with uh, anger issues. And it's something that I'm really trying to come to grips with. Um, I was, <laughs> and uh, not to get too political, but I was very angry after uh, November 8th, 2016. Um, I've been angry ever since Trayvon Martin was murdered and saw that many, it's gone on a uh, hundred times since then. I get angry when I see things like inner city violence in Chicago and that not a lot of attention is being paid to inner city violence in Chicago, in Baltimore, in Detroit, in Brooklyn, um, in L.A. So I, I'm struggling with anger. I, I'm struggling with kind of looking around me and seeing how, just how much things change, um, how we don't learn from lessons of the past. Um, you know, I, I always tell me I read the Sunday paper. I only read the Sunday Times, um, and it depresses me uh, 30 times during, this, during Sunday when I read it. And I'm struggling now with trying to get over uh, just anger at the at the constant situ situation in the world and the constant reality that I believe humanity is maybe uh, doesn't have the strength to to do the right thing often. Um, and so it's it, I don't know if that answers your question, but it is something that I'm trying to work on now. Um, dealing with this newfound anger, which is kind of funny because, um, you know, it's it's come along now that I'm close to 50 years old where I never had it before earlier. Um, I guess, you know, the older you get, the more you realize that how ignorant you are and you learn all this stuff that maybe you didn't want to learn. But uh, that's, what I'm, that's my constant struggle now is dealing with this constant... And I wouldn't say... I don't want to say it's overwhelming. Like, I don't walk around cursing all the time but there is this kind of subtle anger like that I get up and hear listen to the radio and hear and have to really bite my tongue and and hope that I don't have an outburst thank you for sharing my pleasure thanks for asking I just want to really thank you Jerry for um, not just writing the book but speaking with us and, and sharing uh, I think for me, the, your forgiveness is what um, inspires me the most. Uh, that's something I've struggled with, is forgiving people. I'm not good at it. Um, and I, I wanted to share a story. I worked in, and lived and went to college in Oakland. I went to California College of Arts and Crafts, and I worked at Kaiser Hospital for a year and when I was there, it was kind of like what I imagined uh, being in a MASH um, Army hospital would be like. Uh, I, w I am a veteran, but I was never in combat. I'd never been shot at while I was in the Army, but um, every day we had gunshot victims come in. And like you said, you don't know what happened to Marcus, and you don't think about it. And I think about those guys that came into the ER um, their family and wonder wondering what happened to them. So uh, I, I think your story is maybe even more powerful than you realize and it touched many people in ways that you don't even think about it touched them. Uh, and I just, you know, I can't congratulate you on your forgiveness. I think it's a, a beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. It's, it's, as, you know, I've also been criticized by friends who, I, I, you know, they'll say to me, you know, I'll hear that I have to give a, you know, a, a, I've come to a talk similar to this. And I'll say, you know, I don't really know if I have anything more to say about this. Like, you know, I've talked it to death. It's a small story. It's, it's like not something that I think that many people are interested in. And then I, I hear 
um, later on, like people will reach out to me and they'll remind me that, hey, this, it's a story that affects people. And I, I may not think it was that big of a story, but it, it really did touch a lot of people. Um, and so it's always a nice reminder that, hey, you wrote something that maybe stuck with someone. So thank you for saying that. Thank you. It's funny, just on the theme of forgiveness, if I may, um, I was always deeply touched by a story that I read um, in the paper about a year ago um, about uh, mothers in Rwanda who lost thousands of sons to the Rwandan genocide. And a lot of them were lost to like other child soldiers who you know, were, were charged with murdering and, and who were tr basically trained as child soldiers to go and kill other child soldiers and adults. And I was just always, I was very deeply struck by a story I read a year ago about a lot of these mothers who lost sons, um, but the, who went on to adopt the men who uh, killed their sons. And um, and you want to talk about forgiveness there? Like that's that just blows my mind. And and I wonder if I would have the strength to forgive someone who killed my son and, um, or my daughter. But uh, so forgiveness is something that I always am looking. I'm I'm always touched by stories of forgiveness and always humbled by them. And I'm just glad, I'm so grateful that I found it within me. It's, it's because really, at the end of the day, another thing I wanted to come, I wanted to come across, which is that holding on to anger and holding anger inside of you is one of the most destructive things you can do. Um, it's really a very vicious cycle that it becomes almost like cancerous to hold on to anger and any chance you have to let it go, I, I, I say welcome that chance. Uh, thank you for coming here and speaking with us. Um, I saw something recently about parts of the ADA getting repealed. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah. Um, so I know that lots of, uh, there were not lots of parts, but several parts of the ADA, especially where healthcare is concerned, are being considered for uh, diminishing some of the benefits that people with disabilities get. Um, and if some of the repeals come through of uh, so-called Obamacare, then there are going to be lots of people with disabilities who, who were able to have this type of benefit who are now going to have to try to find another way to have that benefit come about or, or to, to make up for that loss. Um, fortunately, <laughs> funny thing, fortunately, um, it, was, it wasn't passed. Like a lot of senators actually... Senators who surprised me stood up and actually said, you know, I can't uh, support this version of the repeal. And so fortunately to this day, they, those still haven't gone through, but I, I have concerns. Um, I'm fortunate, you know, I'm not on Medicare or Medicaid. Um, I've actually had a, a full-time job for a long time, um, but I have lots of friends who are on Medicare and Medicaid who depend on those benefits to uh, hire attendants, um, get there, get certain machines they need. Um, I have a friend who's on dialysis who, if that, some of these uh, benefits are repealed, they would have to try to find other ways to get medications. Um, they may not be able to have an attendant full time. Um, so I just I just hope that the, the right thing keeps happening in terms of that. And that it seems like they've backed off of health care now and are going to try to destroy a lot of other good things. Thank you. Hey, uh, what does the musical offer you in relaying the life of Trayvon Martin, and what are your influences on that project? Uh, <laughs> good question. It's funny. You know, um, I think back to like when I first became uh, involved in, in musicals, and I think it, relate, it, it goes back to when I was a kid and I first saw like a, there was a Broadway version of The Wiz, which I don't know if anyone knows, it's like the, it's like the, the black version of The Wizard of Oz. And I saw a Broadway version of it um, and I thought, wow, what a great thing that one person could be standing there talking one minute and then singing the next. And it's, 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 I get made fun of a lot by a lot of my friends. A lot of my friends hate musicals. Um, but I just love the idea that through a song, you can convey a certain emotion. You can maybe teach someone something or tell a story. You know, Hamilton is a great idea. Is a great uh, uh, idea of that and a great 
example of how you can educate, entertain, and move people with song. And for some reason, um, musicals have always been a big part of my life. I, I love musicals. Um, and now I just find that uh, for some reason, I thought it would be a beautiful thing to kind of, I was very much inspired by, again, Trayvon Martin's mother's memoir. And there were parts when I was reading that book um, where I thought, hey, this could be a song. Like when she talks about how, there's a part in the book where she talks about how she wishes she could have been there when her son um, called out. You know, he called out at one point, made a phone call, um, but she wasn't there to receive it. And she wishes she could have been there to receive that phone call. And I thought, this is this is a very touching moment that if conveyed musically could really uh, touch a lot of people. And um, I just, for some reason, I find it uh, satisfying to try to convey emotions through song and to try to um, touch audiences through songs. I've seen it happen a lot. Like I, said, I used to work for a children's theater company in New York and um, just seen many wonderful moments that can come about when a composer and a singer and a, a lyricist get together at a piano and make magic happen. I just I think there's something beautiful about the musical form. And um, yeah, and I, I just, I hope that I have the opportunity to at least have a, a reading or, or some kind of screening of the musical I've been working on because I'm halfway through it and I really do believe it has the ability to, to touch. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> This is sad also. I mean, in a way, it's funny. There's always this uh, whole notion also. Am I exploiting someone else's pain? Like, and by telling this story, uh, but I know that I'm doing it out of love. But at the same time, it's like, am I just exploiting um, this person's story and this mother's story for some kind of gain of my own? Like, you know, I'm not looking to win a Tony Award. I'm not looking for monetary gain. But I guess in a way, I am looking for something like I want to tell this story and at the same time it's like, but maybe this mother would like to put this behind her or something. So it's one of those things that I question my motive sometimes. But I also know that I'm doing it out of love, that I really love this story and I believe that the world should know about what happened to Trayvon Martin. You're a Martin. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I know that uh, Jay Z is like doing a whole huge document. He's produced a whole huge documentary on the whole Trayvon Martin um, story, and that's due out soon. And so, um, so I, I know that the, the possibilities are out there. But I think I'll also I'm probably not the only person who's had this idea. True, true. Do you think you'll ever write another memoir? <laughs> It's funny, uh, Isabel Arende has written about four memoirs, um, and there are several other writers who have written several memoirs. I honestly don't believe, unless something amazing happens in my life, um, I don't believe I have another memoir. I don't believe I have another story in me, like really worth telling. I've had some funny jobs in my life. I've had a lot of funny jobs. Um, and I also, I often believe that someday it would be fun to like write a comedy book about just the different types of jobs I've had. I've had some terrible jobs, and I've had some great jobs. Um, I thought it'd be great fun to write a, a comedy about just some of the jobs I've had, but really memoir, I don't believe I have another story in me worth telling anyway, like really worth sharing, putting out on paper. I can project. I can project. I'm really curious about the projects you're working on now. I'll give you like three questions to answer, maybe, uh, and and maybe your process, um, how you approach them, because um, your writing does seem to come from a closeness and uh, like. Or here we're at an art school, and there's this saying, you know, kill your darlings. Sometimes you have to just mm -hmm. kind of like nix out that sentence, and you just don't want to. Yeah, yeah I'm going through that right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the the other question I have is, um, uh, how is it 
In Portland, um, you know, it's a really rich city for writing and uh, supposed progressivism, but yet there's a saying that I kind of ascribe to, which is it's okay to be different as long as you're the same as everybody else, <laughs> um, which kind of informs my perspective of this place. And um, anyway, one of three or all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, let's see, th you asked about my writing process. Did you have one, yeah, one yeah, other question? Yeah. Um, you know, I I do my best. I have a full time job now, unfortunately, so I can't write as often as I'd like. I'm I'm more of a weekend writer, but I can say um, I've always always been fascinated by stories that involve people of different cultures and different class backgrounds, um, and it's probably because I feel like I've been extremely fortunate to live uh, in very varied circumstances. I've lived among extremely rich people. I've lived among extremely poor people. I've been extremely poor. I've never been extremely rich. I'm still looking forward to that, but I've been extremely poor. Um, but, I've, I've, but I've also, I've been welcomed into the houses of so many wealthy people, and um, I've been a guest in so many houses, and I'm always kind of shocked by what people live with and have and that they can complain about and what people don't have and they don't complain about, and vice versa. Um, so I'm always amazed by the difference of cultures. Um, and the last two projects I've worked on have been, uh, the t two novels I've worked on have been stories about people from vastly different cultures. And now I'm actually, it's a story that I'm very much in love with, but I'm at that phase where I'm killing a lot of my as, as, you know, darlings, as you say. Um, and it's a story about an interracial relationship um, it's kind of a May-December story about a young black male in New York who becomes involved with a middle-aged Jewish woman and just how difficult um, their relationship is because of their varied backgrounds. Um, and at ultimately, it's impossible for them to be together because of it. Um, and it's, it's funny, I think it, I take some of that from my own experience. I've had a very difficult time with uh, accepting some of my wealthier friends in, in life who I feel were handed so much to them. Um, and I think that that's where a lot of this story comes out of. And it's a lot of, it's at the basis of a lot of what I write. Um, it's just the, the, the difference between cultures, um, the difference between class. Class is such, to me, a huge, huge part of what makes existence so ugly. Um, and it's something I'm constantly struggling with. Um, so that's, I don't even know how I got to that, um, talking about my writing process, but I've, I've taken some of that story from real life events and a lot of it, uh, has occurred in my life. Um, to answer your question about Portland, um, I really... It's funny, I started out in Eugene, and actually I moved to Eugene from California because I thought it would be a beautiful place to write. I saw that it rained nine months out of the year, and I thought, great, that would really inspire me to write and what have you. And it has actually, it's been very good for me. Um, I love this climate, and I love this um, this, this scenery here. I, I find it all very inspiring. But at the same time, I, I also find that I really, really miss diversity. I miss diversity. I miss walking down the street and um, hearing different languages. Um, I, I was in New York back in October and just the idea that I would walk into a restaurant and not be the only black person in the restaurant, that I would go to a movie theater and not be the only black person in the movie theater, not be the only black person in the coffee house, um, it's, it's something that really has an effect on me, and I, I really find that when I get to big cities, and I just, I was in San Francisco a couple weeks ago for work, and I just really, really miss being around other brown people as well, and it's just something that um, clearly doesn't happen in Portland as often, um, and is happening a lot less. Um, but at the same time, you know, I try not to knock Portland, because I really do believe that, you know, there's a, 
that yeah, there's a progressiveness here that maybe seems on the surface more surfacey than actual. But I really do believe that Portland is a beautiful place. That there are people here that have their hearts in the right places more than a lot of places I've lived, um, and people here who really have a sincere desire to to see the the world, you know, to to make the world a more progressive place. And I think it's just it's just, it's difficult here in Portland. It's very difficult for so many reasons. Um, but I have to say, I believe that Portland has a great soul. I've never, ever felt um, in danger in Portland, or in Eugene for that matter. Um, I used to live in Ashland, Oregon, um, and worked in Medford. I don't know if anyone's ever been out that way, but there were times when I didn't feel as safe in that area. Um, but I've never, ever once felt threatened in Portland. I've never felt disrespected. Um, no one has ever used any terminology with me. Sometimes I wonder if being in a wheelchair um, has sheltered me from some of that ugliness that I know a lot of my colleagues have felt and a lot of my friends have voiced, but no one has ever treated me in a way, well, it's <laughs> sometimes downtown. I, I, get, I, t t I tell a story in my book too, but I often sometimes would be downtown and I'll be mistaken for like a homeless person um, and someone will give me like a dollar. It happens like, almost once a week, um, especially in the summer. I'll be hanging out outside and someone will pass by some friendly person and hand me $5. Um, it happened in Vegas a couple of months ago. And so that, I, that happens to me. But really, I've never felt um, threatened in Portland. I've never felt disrespected. Test. <laughs> Testing. <laughs> One, two, three. Let the bombs begin. No. Um, <laughs> some time ago, um, I was in Georgia. <laughs> some time ago. And uh, you said something that reminded me of this situation, and maybe it'll connect if, if I can tell it quite briefly. I was talking to an African-American woman, black woman, older than me, considerably older, about voting. And I was going on, I was, again, much, much younger. I went on and on about people that died in order to vote and da 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 da, da. And I'll never forget what she said, and it connected, uh, you reminded me of this situation, of, of what she said uh, when you were talking about activism and in our own way, we are all activists, and you know, I receive all kind. We receive information to contribute to this for this cause and that cause, and sometimes I'll send it back. I'll send a note back saying, you know, I can't afford to make a contribution, but I do vote, and I let them know what my uh, um, political affiliation is. Mm -hmm. uh, but this uh, African American woman, black woman, said, you know in terms of people dying and uh, you know having to fight for rights she said well i ain't never voted and uh, i ain't gonna vote and she said now uh, the way i see it is no matter who's elected uh, there's gonna be some good and some bad so i'll get some of uh, some of both uh, but uh, uh, i um had lots of some other things I wanted to share too, but I, I, as far as the activism goes, we we all are activists, and and there are times when we do feel that uh, this place is not as inclusive. I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but just to build on that feeling of um, it was clear to me when you were talking and when you responded. But but I, I think that that uh, and again, what you build on is a fact the. The, the hope the, the, that, is, that, that is or may become Portland, you know, uh, uh, we go even, you know, back in time with Lewis and Clark, the York who came, who, you know, this, the, 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 the trek would not have been successful without the, the woman, the black man, and, and of course, the white men too. You know, we don't mm -hmm. want to exclude anybody. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 
um, I'll just offer my appreciation, but I'll never forget what, uh, I think it was her name was Miss Meredith, she said. And during that time, was, to let you give you some idea as to how old I am, was when um, George Wallace was shot. Wow. And then and, and I said, you know, if, if he, you know, in spite of the fact that he was what he was, I said, you know, it's not right, you know, no, 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 no. Anybody can get shot. She said, well, child, that may be so, but I ain't voted, I ain't going to vote, because the way I see it, there's only some good. But, you know, we have to take it beyond that, quite certainly. Thank you. It's funny, I can, when the way you say that, I can almost visualize that woman that you were talking to. As far as uh, the mu thank you, uh, and thank you, thank everyone. Um, as far as this musical thing goes, look at the stuff that's been done recently at, um, uh, gosh, it escapes me, the arts, art uh, theater up here. Didn't they do uh, recently this conversation? Uh, the, they did a music uh, play about the folks uh, doing scientific uh, work at in Antarctica. Did any of you happen to? What was the name of that that uh, play at uh, Art Repertory? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it, and there was a woman who was a, a scientist, and she had to speak to the 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 the, the, the Russian scientist, and uh, uh, they had to come to some agreement at the bottom of the earth. So there's uh, I, um, Miss Saigon, uh, a, a musical or opera. So your, your writing about Trayvon Martin uh, will only add to the pages of uh, this great book that is still being um, composed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. No, 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 no. I insist. <laughs> reminded me of another story. Some friends, of, <laughs> some, some friends of mine, I was visiting, I'll just say this now, shut up. I was, I was visiting with some friends and this happens to be an individual who was a student of mine uh, some years ago. So now I've had the distinct honor, pleasure to uh, be a friend of um, his family and to see his daughter um, um, grow to be five years old. And we were playing this game, thousand, ten thousand, something or other, where you throw the dice and and uh, you, uh, anyway, um, so <laughs> her name is Shelby, and I started out big because I, you know, I have to get like a thousand. I, anyway, I started out with a fifteen hundred points, and Shelby, as a five year old, she can. I, I don't even remember how the thing is scored. Uh, ten thousand points. You can Google it. I Google it. I'm going to try to find out. Uh, but um, I kept saying to her, "I want you to win." And she'd say to me, no, I want you to win. <laughs> but then when she'd throw the dice, I said, I want you to win. She says, I want me, I want, I want me to win too. So, so, so anyway, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for recording it up there. <laughs>